Chapter Twenty Six of The People of the Abyss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The People of the Abyss by Jack London. Chapter Twenty Six. Drink, Temperance, and Thrift. The English working classes may be said to be soaked in beer. They are made dull and sodden by it. Their efficiency is sadly impaired, and they lose whatever imagination, invention, and quickness may be theirs by right of race. It may hardly be called an acquired habit, for they are accustomed to it from their earliest infancy. Children are begotten in drunkenness, saturated in drink before they draw their first breath, born to the smell and taste of it, and brought up in the midst of it. The public house is ubiquitous, it flourishes on every corner, and between corners, and it is frequented almost as much by women as by men. Children are to be found in it as well, waiting till their fathers and mothers are ready to go home, sipping from the glasses of their elders, listening to the coarse language and degrading conversation, catching the contagion of it, familiarising themselves with licentiousness and debauchery. Mrs. Grundy rules as supremely over the workers as she does over the bourgeoisie, but in the case of the workers, the one thing she does not frown upon is the public house. No disgrace or shame attaches to it, nor to the young woman or girl who makes a practice of entering it. I remember a girl in a coffee-house saying, I never drink spirits when in a public house. She was a young and pretty waitress, and she was laying down to another waitress her pre-eminent respectability and discretion. Mrs. Grundy drew the line at spirits, but allowed that it was quite proper for a clean young girl to drink beer, and to go into a public house to drink it. Not only is this beer unfit for the people to drink, but too often the men and women are unfit to drink it. On the other hand, it is their very unfitness that drives them to drink it. Ill-fed, suffering from innutrition and the evil effects of overcrowding and squalor, their constitutions develop a morbid craving for the drink, just as the sickly stomach of the overstrung Manchester factory operative hankers after excessive quantities of pickles and similar weird foods. Unhealthy working and living engenders unhealthy appetites and desires. Man cannot be worked worse than a horse is worked, and be housed and fed as a pig is housed and fed, and at the same time have clean and wholesome ideals and aspirations. As home life vanishes, the public house appears. Not only do men and women abnormally crave drink, who are overworked, exhausted, suffering from deranged stomachs and bad sanitation, and deadened by the ugliness and monotony of existence, but the gregarious men and women who have no home life flee to the bright and clattering public house in a vain attempt to express their gregariousness, and when a family is housed in one small room, home life is impossible. A brief examination of such a dwelling will serve to bring to light one important cause of drunkenness. Here the family arises in the morning, dresses and makes its toilet, father, mother, sons and daughters, and in the same room, shoulder to shoulder, for the room is small, the wife and mother cooks the breakfast, and in the same room, heavy and sickening with the exhalations of their packed bodies throughout the night, that breakfast is eaten. The father goes to work, the elder children go to school or into the street, and the mother remains with her crawling, toddling youngsters to do her housework, still in the same room. Here she washes the clothes, filling the pent space with soap suds and the smell of dirty clothes, and overhead she hangs the wet linen to dry. Here in the evening, amid the manifold smells of the day, the family goes to its virtuous couch. That is to say, as many as possible pile into the one bed, if bed they have, and the surplus turns in on the floor. And this is the round of their existence, month after month, year after year. For they never get a vacation save when they are evicted. When a child dies, and some are always bound to die, since fifty-five per cent of the East End children die before they are five years old, the body is laid out in the same room. And if they are very poor... It is kept for some time until they can bury it. During the day it lies on the bed. During the night, when the living takes the bed, the dead occupies the table, from which in the morning, when the dead is put back into the bed, they eat their breakfast. Sometimes the body is placed on the shelf, which serves as a pantry for their food. 
Only a couple of weeks ago an East End woman was in trouble because, in this fashion, being unable to bury it, she had kept her dead child three weeks. Now, such a room as I have described is not home but horror, and the men and women who flee away from it to the public house are to be pitied, not blamed. There are 300,000 people in London divided into families that live in single rooms, while there are 900,000 who are illegally housed, according to the Public Health Act of 1891, a respectable recruiting ground for the drink traffic. Then there are the insecurity of happiness, the precariousness of existence, the well-founded fear of the future, potent factors in driving people to drink. Wretchedness squirms for alleviation, and in the public house its pain is eased and forgetfulness is obtained. It is unhealthy, certainly it is, but everything else about their lives is unhealthy, while this brings the oblivion that nothing else in their lives can bring. It even exalts them and makes them feel that they are finer and better, though at the same time it drags them down and makes them more beastly than ever. For the unfortunate man or woman, it is a race between miseries that ends with death. It is of no avail to preach temperance and teetotalism to these people. The drink habit may be the cause of many miseries, but it is in turn the effect of other and prior miseries. The temperance advocates may preach their hearts out over the evils of drink, but until the evils that cause people to drink are abolished, drink and its evils will remain. Until the people who try to help realize this, their well-intentioned efforts will be futile, and they will present a spectacle fit only to set Olympus laughing. I have gone through an exhibition of Japanese art got up for the poor of Whitechapel with the idea of elevating them, of begetting in them yearnings for the beautiful and true and good, granting, what is not so, that the poor folk are thus taught to know and yearn after the beautiful and true and good, the foul facts of their existence and the social law that dooms one in three to a public charity death demonstrate that this knowledge and yearning will be only so much of an added curse to them. They will have so much more to forget than if they had never known and yearned. Did destiny today bind me down to the life of an East End slave for the rest of my years, and did destiny grant me but one wish, I should ask that I might forget all about the beautiful and true and good, that I might forget all I had learned from the open books, and forget the people I had known, the things I had heard, and the lands I had seen, and if destiny didn't grant it, I am pretty confident that I should get drunk and forget it as often as possible. These people who try to help, their college settlements, missions, charities and what not, are failures. In the nature of things they cannot but be failures. They are wrongly, though sincerely, conceived. They approach life through a misunderstanding of life, these good folk. They do not understand the West End, yet they come down to the East End as teachers and savants. They do not understand the simple sociology of Christ, yet they come to the miserable and the despised with the pomp of social redeemers. They have worked faithfully, but beyond relieving an infinitesimal fraction of misery and collecting a certain amount of data, which might otherwise have been more scientifically and less expensively collected, they have achieved nothing. As someone has said, they do everything for the poor except get off their backs. The very money they dribble out in their child's schemes has been wrung from the poor. They come from a race of successful and predatory bipeds who stand between the worker and his wages, and they try to tell the worker what he shall do with the pitiful balance left to him. Of what use in the name of God is it to establish nurseries for women workers, in which, for instance, a child is taken while the mother makes violets in Islington at three farthings a gross, when more children and violet makers than they can cope with are being born right along. This violet maker handles each flower four times, five hundred and seventy-six handlings for three farthings, and in the day she handles the flowers six thousand nine hundred and twelve times for a wage of ninepence. She is being robbed. Somebody is on her back, and a yearning for the beautiful and true and good will not lighten her burden. They do nothing for her, these dabblers, and what they do not do for the mother, 
undoes at night when the child comes home all that they have done for the child in the day. And one and all they join in teaching a fundamental lie. They do not know it is a lie, but their ignorance does not make it more of a truth. And the lie they preach is thrift. An instant will demonstrate it. In overcrowded London, the struggle for a chance to work is keen, and because of this struggle, wages sink to the lowest means of subsistence. To be thrifty means for a worker to spend less than his income, in other words, to live on less. This is equivalent to a lowering of the standard of living. In the competition for a chance to work, the man with a lower standard of living will underbid the man with a higher standard, and a small group of such thrifty workers in any overcrowded industry will permanently lower the wages of that industry, and the thrifty ones will no longer be thrifty, for their income will have been reduced till it balances their expenditure. In short, thrift negates thrift. If every worker in England should heed the preachers of thrift and cut expenditure in half, the condition of there being more men to work than there is work to do would swiftly cut wages in half, and then none of the workers of England would be thrifty, or they would be living up to their diminished incomes. The short-sighted thrift preachers would naturally be astounded at the outcome. The measure of their failure would be precisely the measure of the success of their propaganda. And anyway, it is sheer bosh and nonsense to preach thrift to the 1,800,000 London workers who are divided into families which have a total income of less than 21 shillings per week, one quarter to one half of which must be paid for rent. Concerning the futility of the people who try to help, I wish to make one notable, noble exception, namely the Dr. Barnardo homes. Dr. Barnardo is a child-catcher. First he catches them when they are young, before they are set, hardened, in the vicious social mould, and then he sends them away to grow up and be formed in another and better social mould. Up to date he has sent out of the country 13,340 boys, most of them to Canada, and not one in fifty has failed. A splendid record when it is considered that these lads are waifs and strays, homeless and parentless, jerked out from the very bottom of the abyss, and forty-nine out of fifty of them made into men. Every twenty-four hours in the year Dr. Barnardo snatches nine waifs from the streets, so the enormous field he has to work in may be comprehended. The people who try to help have something to learn from him. He does not play with palliatives. He traces social viciousness and misery to their sources. He removes the progeny of the gutter folk from their pestilential environment and gives them a healthy, wholesome environment in which to be pressed and prodded and moulded into men. When the people who try to help cease their playing and dabbling with day nurseries and Japanese art exhibits, and go back and learn their West End and the sociology of Christ, they will be in better shape to buckle down to the work they ought to be doing in the world. And if they do buckle down to the work, they will follow Dr. Barnardo's lead, only on a scale as large as the nation is large. They won't cram yearnings for the beautiful and true and good down the throat of the woman making violets for three farthings a gross, but they will make somebody get off her back and quit cramming himself till, like the Romans, he must go to a bath and sweat it out. And to their consternation they will find that they will have to get off that woman's back themselves, as well as the backs of a few other women and children they did not dream they were riding upon. End of chapter 26